I had been having panic attacks for years. I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. I'd say now, like it's a, it was like a voice, but it almost, you know, it was like in my own voice telling me that. It's confusing. You've been following God. You've been pursuing God. You've been doing ministry with God. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, yet there was something that wasn't right. And he's like, are you willing to let go of tradition and religion to go deeper with me? Hey gang, welcome back to Directed Life. This is the show to equip entrepreneurs, influencers, and everyday people to live directed by the Holy Spirit in their craft, career, and calling so that we can all flip culture upside down for the kingdom of God. I'm your host, Cap Chaffield, and today I'm joined by a really good friend of mine. Her name is Lauren Kite. She and I got connected in Omaha a few years ago. She was part of my church. And without her, guys, quite honestly, the Axe film that a lot of you have seen would not exist. So I went to Kenya with her husband, Brendan, a couple years back where we shot the documentary Axe. And today we're not talking about Axe and we're not talking about Love Church necessarily, but we are gonna talk about a really amazing story that this young lady has walked through in regards to being a lover of Jesus, experiencing some bottleneck in her walk with Jesus and not really living the free life that Jesus promised for us to live. And then she experienced some crazy deliverance and freedom and really a supernatural encounter with God. And God's been overwhelming her with prophetic vision since then as well. And our hope today is to really bring hope to people who love God, they want to follow God, but they're in that a similar place where they're like, man, there's something that's just not quite right. And I can't discipline my way out of this. Is there an answer? And the answer is, yes, there is. And Lauren's going to give an idea of what that answer and that breakthrough for you might look like. So Lauren, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is really exciting. <laughs> I know you're a little nervous. So I guys, am, just so you know, I'm nervous. <laughs> she's not a professional content creator. She's no. not a professional podcaster. But I know that you guys will give her charity because this woman is really a powerhouse filled with the Holy Spirit, has open visions and dreams like no one I've ever met before, quite honestly. It's like every day God is revealing things to her. And so it's really a treat to have her on the show. But Lauren, I really want to just give you an opportunity just to share. And so throughout this time, as you're sharing your story, I might chime in from moment to moment, ask further questions or bring some scripture into what you're saying. But I really want you to just take the stage really as far back as you think is appropriate. Where does your story with Jesus and this process of deliverance begin? Yeah, so I was five years old when I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I grew up in a Christian family. And I know a lot of times there's people who become Christians as a child and then like they go their wayward way and whatever. And I definitely was not perfect, but I never had that like, oh, let me turn from God moment in my life and just go be rebellious or go have this crazy season. And so honestly, as long as I can remember, I have walked with the Lord. And I remember even in high school, starting in high school, I remember I was waking up every morning. A lot of mornings would be like 5 a.m. to have my quiet time with the Lord and basically doing all the Christian things, right? So it was Life, I would say, looking back now, it wasn't the abundant life. I was doing all the things to check off all the boxes to be a good Christian. And uh, because that's what I was supposed to do. When I got to, I guess, 30, 30 years old, when we were living in Omaha, we were coming to Love Church. And that was a very different church from anything we'd ever been to. We grew up in the Bible Belt in the southeast of the United States. You know, it was very, it was the Bible Belt. And when we got out to Omaha, we experienced Love Church, which was very different. And there was more of, um, not that the Holy Spirit had never really been mentioned before, but it was just more uh, active in the church, I guess. And the Lord really started to reveal some stuff to me in my life as far as fears. Um, I had been having panic attacks for years. I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. And one day he just really started revealing that stuff to me. And it was this really actually long, hard season of probably a year or two where he walked me through 
um, just setting me free from that worry and anxiety. And I felt much freer after that. And I remember in 2020, I was folding laundry in my laundry room. And I remember the Lord challenging me. Um, I feel like 2020 was such a crazy year. I feel like a lot of questions had started to come in my mind of like, what are things that I believe that maybe I believe solely because it's what I was taught. Like it's what mm. I was taught as a Christian. And so I remember the Lord challenging me, I'm folding laundry and he's like, are you willing to let go of tradition and religion to like go deeper with me? And I remember thinking, I'm not a religious Pharisee person. I in fact very much was, but like, I just remember thinking, no, not me, you know, um, because I had always been this good girl and hadn't, you know, in my mind, it's like, well, I haven't had this crazy season in my life, whatever. So I remember finally one day just being looking, just it's like that song says of shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. And that started to become my prayer. So not long after I started having these just thoughts that didn't make sense to me. And I did not say a word. I will preface this by saying, so that would have been maybe, no, 2023 this year was the first time like I let those thoughts come out of my mouth to anyone Mm. other than my husband and even him, it took me a really long time to admit them because I was having these these thoughts of like, I'd be driving down the road and all of a sudden it's like I would hear something say drive off the road. And I'm like, who is that coming from? Like, that's that's not my thought. Like, I'm not a depressed person. Like, I, I don't want to take my own life. So, Ask you a question, Lauren, real quick. Yeah, about those absolutely. Thoughts. Were those thoughts, because I'll be honest, there's been times where like I'll like be walking and there'd be a balcony over like a 10 story thing or whatever. And I'll have the thought, I really don't want to fall over that thing. It's more of a curiosity rather than like a compulsion. And my question to you is like, how would you describe that thought? Was it just like a passing? I wonder if I like accidentally swerved off the road or was it a more deliberate, like you should drive off the road and try to hurt yourself? Yeah, it was like drive off the road. And it was never necessarily try and kill yourself by driving off the road. But it was like, hey, drive off the road. And I remember it would get to a point where I would like certain points. It was in my drive to work every day. There was like one point. And I remember just dreading getting to that point because I remembered thinking, I don't want to drive off the road. But feeling like there was this, I mean, I'd say now like it's it was like a voice, but it almost, you know, it was like, in my own voice telling me that it's it's confusing like I didn't know what that was and I knew I wasn't a depressed person I knew I wasn't a suicidal person I loved my life like I you know I loved the Lord I'm like what is this and it progressed and I had some other different um thoughts and I finally came to my husband and I just said hey I'm really struggling with these things Um, And I didn't even know how to put them into words to him because I think in my mind now I look back and I was feeling shame for feeling that stuff Mm. because I felt like here I was like a Christian who loved the Lord and I was, you know, supposed to be living this joy filled, spirit filled, free life. And I was having these thoughts. And so, you know, we really prayed through it for a while and I'd say they kind of got better. We ended up moving from Omaha. And the Lord really just took me, I now look back and know into this season of of rest. We lived in this sweet town by the ocean in Florida. And I look back at it now and I'm like, the Lord knew I needed that rest before I came into the season that I'm in now. Um, And it was a sweet season. And then we moved out here in Colorado last October. And man, it just, it all hit the fan is the best way to say it. Like it was hard. Like I'd never had a move be so hard. Um, just, I would say almost spiritual oppression. I felt like I was under attack of the enemy all day, every day. Things that just didn't make sense were happening. Doors would be open, like normal things that happen in everyday life. And then they just slam in my face. And I'm just like, I mean, it was hard. Um, and we actually, had a conversation. I remember we sat down with you and Joy, uh, I guess back in maybe April, and you were preaching about kind of some of the stuff at church the next day. And I just remember feeling a prompting of the Holy Spirit to like, just ask you what you thought about deliverance and Christians. Uh, Because 
I don't know that I really heard the word deliverance up until maybe a couple years ago. And in my mind and how I had grown up, it was always, I just thought people that were like had demons were non-Christian people. Um, the ones you see like screaming, yelling on the side of the road, or, you know, I've spent time in Kenya. So you would see people possessed with demons and, you know, you would see those being called out of people. But that in my mind, it was 100% just not something that that could possibly be happening to me. Um, so with encouragement from you and your wife, I ended up reading a book called Soul Care. Man, my eyes were just open to a lot of things. And the biggest thing with that was um, just d- like Jesus's deliverance ministry. Um, one, it was not a subpar ministry. It was like a huge part of his ministry. Yes. And two, okay. he came to deliver um, the chosen people. Like he was delivering Jewish people. And um, while there were not Christians that were delivered at that time, you know, it was Jewish people here, del- he was delivering. So when you start looking at what the scripture actually says, um, it has been so mistaught in our church and in our Western culture. And it is, I think, something that shame is attached to. There are many people I have shared this story with and their eyes get really weirded out when I start talking about this because it's just not <laughs> something uh, that we talk about. So basically, I then pursued, I was like, okay, so now I know I need deliverance. Um, I went to a deliverance ministry at our church and I should back up a little bit and just say, when I work through that book, and I think it's so important for anyone that does go through deliverance or need deliverance knows um, it is a process. It is not a, hey, demons come out and it is just like over type thing. It was a process because I there were so many things I had to work out. There were past hurts I needed to work out. There were unforgiveness is such a big one. And when you really start to ask the Lord to search your heart and show you places that you have not forgiven people, you can't be set free if you choose to not forgive. And so I had to work through, I mean, I I worked through stuff for six months before I was even ready to go into having a a deliverance appointment. And um I'll say I even struggled like going into that deliverance appointment. I really struggled with like, I was still struggling as I walked in the day of like, is this really a thing? Am I going to go in there? Like, I'm like, Lord, I want to have faith. Like, I want to be set free. But like, is this really a thing? I found out it was. (laughs) Um, And I went into that deliverance appointment. And, um, you know, really when I should say this too, when a Christian A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. We are bought by the blood of the lamb and Mm -hmm. we cannot be possessed. They do not own us. Jesus Christ is our savior and our Lord and they cannot own us. Um, Our spirit, we have have our spirit, the Holy Spirit that is redeemed. That is the redeemed part of me. But there is my flesh. There is my will, my mind, my emotions. And those things are not yet in their fully redeemed state. Mm -hmm. And so I can be influenced by evil spirits and I still really struggled. But, you know, like I was at this place of um, I will say I didn't realize how much oppression I think I was under until I was in my deliverance appointment. And Mm -hmm. as I was in there and they were praying, this different stuff started to come up and I realized as they're calling these spirits up and out, you know, you, you have to break those legal ties because if if I'm holding on to, you know, whatever sin, if I'm holding on to anger and I'm refusing to not let go of that anger, then I'm giving, I'm opening that door. You know, the Bible says, don't give the enemy a foothold. I'm opening that door for for the enemy to influence that part of my life. So I've got to break all those ties. Then they can leave. They have no right to stay. I mean, there were so many things. There was, you know, the spirit of depression. There was hopelessness. Um, there was anger. I mean, there were, there were so many things I did not realize were dwelling within me. But when I got done, in the weeks after, I realized that I'd had so many voices speaking in my head for so long that were not my own. And I just really started to understand, like, I've been set free. Um one of the, I think, greatest moments and truths that stick out to me 
um, from the deliverance session is just the power of Jesus was such a beautiful thing. Um, there is spiritual warfare going on all around us. And there's many people who choose to believe it's not really there or a thing or people that are aware of it, but just don't really, I don't know how to see it or they're not aware of how much it is around us. And being in that um, place of being in that war, but knowing that the power of Jesus was on my side, there were certain situations in that deliverance appointment where things in my body were happening that I was not able to control, but calling on the name of Jesus made them stop and go away. Just seeing that power in the name of Jesus, I will never forget that. And it was just such, it was such a precious moment um, for me. But one of the big things um, that I did deal with through, throughout all this was, um, was family things, was these generational sins that had come down. Um, you know, within the Bible, you see it in the Bible. Um, I feel like, again, when, when it's talked about, it's generally talked about as like, okay, you have an alcoholic in your family, like alcoholism is, you know, passed down or depression, which that was something that I knew was like a family trait um, for me. And um, actually, I didn't even mention part of what kind of got me into this is I was seeing things in my nine-year-old. Um, things in her that didn't make sense to me, things she was feeling, um, just things she was struggling with. And I'm like, this is not normal for a nine-year-old to feel. And then I remembered thinking back to me as a child and thinking I was feeling these things too. And then knowing that past generations of my family had also dealt with this stuff. And that was kind of what got me thinking, like there's some kind of generational something going on here. Is it possible that this is something that's been passed down? And so what was hard is I didn't know a lot of what was going on. There was, there was a lot of things um, that just hadn't been talked about in my family. And there was a lot of bondage because of that. And, um, you know, the Lord has brought so much healing to my own family, um, both in, in my daughter. Um, there has been deliverance with her. But then also in past generations and in older generations of my family, healing has happened um, because the Lord has chosen to to set us free in all of this. So you can tell me what you want me to elaborate more on, but that's kind of the gist oh, of everything. Of, I got plenty of material. <laughs> that's the stage really well. No, I, I appreciate I appreciate that overview because there's there's parts that I think we can go a little bit deeper with. But all in all, the summary of what you just shared was that you were, this isn't like you have been half heartedly like, yeah, I kind of believe in God. I'm like, when the Bible says that we are saved by confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing in our hearts that God has r- risen him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 through 10, you have lived that for years. And You've also been doing his will for years. So, and anybody that would want to say, well, you haven't really, like, you probably weren't living it perfectly. You, if that's your argument, you don't even know what the gospel is because the point of the gospel is that we can't do it on our own. You've been following God. You've been pursuing God. You've been doing ministry with God. You've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Yet there was something that wasn't right. And and this is where I think I want to go into a little bit of a teaching moment right now, and then we'll pull out more of your testimony shortly, because I do want to help that person that had the same mental obstacle that you did when you uh, and Brendan were sitting at my wife and I's table and we're talking through that same thing about can a Christian be demonized? And so as you were sharing that, I want to just share Uh, just quite practically with those who are listening right now, you made a great statement about possession. Because when we talk about possession, the reason why we can say that no Christian can be possessed is really because nobody can truly be possessed by anything because possession is talking about ownership. Yeah. And so you mentioned that, that Jesus owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Even those who do not submit to him, he still owns them and he'll do with his his creation whatever he wills. The point that I'm trying to make with that is 
you're so right in regards to we cannot be possessed by demons. So then the question comes, why does the Bible talk about being possessed by demons? You see in areas like Matthew and Mark, there's there's the guy who uh, was pe- possessed by legion, and there's even children that were possessed by demons. This is like literally what it says in the English translation. But the English translation, I want to be very clear, the, the term demon possession is not the best way to describe what occurs. Because when you look at the Greek, I'll, I have the Greek right in front of me right now. Anytime demon possession is mentioned, the true Greek word, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but it's basically daimonizamai. Daimonizamai is the Greek word. And what that word means is demonized, mm-hmm. having influence of a demon. So when people are saying, I think Christians can't have possession, but they can have oppression. In the Greek, there's there's one term. There isn't a differentiation between demon possessed and demon oppressed. However, your comment was really interesting about how Jesus came specifically to help set the Jews free. And so I'm going to, guys, I'm going to bring the word. I got the word of God right in front of me right now. And I'm, I'm sharing this to hopefully help somebody mm-hmm. because there's the odds are that if someone is watching this video up until this point, Lauren, they are struggling in a very similar situation to where you're at right now. Yeah. They li- quite literally are living with thoughts in their heads. They're living, not just thoughts, They're living with voices Mm -hmm. that are not the voice of God, that are not the voice of their human spirit. They are demonic in nature. The things that they're telling them to do and compelling them to do, they are not of God. And somebody needs to hear today that voice in your head telling you to do whatever to yourself or to the other people around you. That is not God and that is not you. That is a demon and it's curable. That's the one thing I want people to catch today is that it's curable. But this is what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5, and I'm going to just go a couple verses into it. This is when Jesus sends out the 12 disciples. It says in verse 5, These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, or those who are not the children of God, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. The final comment that I'll make in regards to that is Jesus himself said a parable about the liberation from demonization. And the parable was this. He likened the person's body to being a house. And what he said was, If that house has a strong man or a thief in it and you drive out that strong man and you tidy everything up on the inside, but there's nobody there to guard the home, then that thief is going to come back around a a few weeks from now. They're going to look inside the window. They're going to see, oh, wow, the house is perfectly put back in order. There's nobody guarding this home. I'm going to bring back seven more stronger than me, and we're going to completely dominate this thing. What was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about making sure you put up a simply safe in your house? No. What he's talking about is if you were to deliver somebody who did not surrender their life to Jesus, if you delivered them of a demon and cleaned up their act a little bit, but didn't replace what was in there with the power of the Holy Spirit, then they don't have a shot in the spiritual warfare because the demons are going to come back and they do not have the power, the individual, I should say, the individual does not have the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to continue to walk in freedom and fight that spiritual war. So there's so much to that, Lauren. The point of this episode is not to like deep dive that too much, but I do want to give some tools to at least help somebody say, you know what? I've been taught and I've believed that Christians cannot be demonized. And I haven't even dove into it at all, but I believe just from those scriptures, it's going to help somebody say, okay, I got some homework to do. I'm going to dive deeper, but you stand before me with a screen in between us right now. And you have a testimony that cannot be denied. You have been walking with God for X amount of years and something just wasn't right. And so I want to share, I would love for you to actually share more in depth about a little bit of the experience of what happened in that deliverance. Because obviously, you know, we talked beforehand, 
you don't need to share the details of what happened in your family line necessarily mm-hmm. to protect those involved. But I would love for you to just be transparent about what happened in this deliverance session. Because when you shared with me what was happening physically with you in that moment and what was going through your mind while that was occurring, to me, I'm just like, dude, the homegirl's not going to fake this event. Are you kidding me? Who wants to like put themselves in a situation and behave like this? Mm-hmm. So, and what she, what happened in that event was also, there's biblical examples of that happening as well. So would you mind sharing a little bit about like literally unpacking for us what that deliverance experience looked like? Yeah. So like I said, when I went in, I remember I was really nervous and just thinking like, is anything going to happen? We prayed a lot. We talked about what deliverance was and wasn't. Um, you know, they said this deliverance is not some like thing that jumps you into spiritual maturity. They made sure I had done all the work before just for anyone that doesn't know, because I wouldn't have known. It was like I had to fill out this form. It took me an hour and a half. And it was just all these different like footholds basically that the enemy could have gotten in, gotten into my life or family's life through. Then we went through and just broke all those ties. And literally, even as we were going through breaking all those ties, they really wanted me to be just aware of like, is there anything in your body that's just acting funny? Is there anything that just in your mind, do you hear something whenever we're going through this stuff? And that was kind of a weird thing for me to try and like, you know, like literally my left foot kept hurting. Like in certain things they would say, I'd be like my left foot. And like, at no point did they think I was crazy. They were like, yeah, okay. And they just wrote it down. Um, but so then we got to, once you, we've done all that, we got to, they're like, okay, we're going to like go in and we're going to cast these things out. And I just remembered thinking like, well, what if nothing happens? I was literally terrified nothing was going to happen. And quickly that did not happen. Um, but, um, you know, they, it talks about in the Bible that, um, that, there is an order to things. Um, you know, there's, there's a certain, um, order of, of the spirit. And so their goal is kind of to get the chief spirit and then cast out what goes beyond that. And, um, like, cause if you can get the head guy, then you can get all the other ones out. Right. And so they started asking questions and I, I literally, I, I went mute. I could not move my tongue. I could not move my lips. And it was just the strangest feeling to all of a sudden be like, I, I cannot move my mouth. At one point, my... There's literally, I wish I could pull it up. If I'm not mistaken, there's a literal story in the Bible of a guy who was mute because of a demon. That experience that you just shared right there, there's biblical precedence for that. So anyway, keep going. This is Um, what you're sharing though. It's like, people don't need to think like, wow, that's really, it's like, if we just read our Bibles, it's like, dude, this is all here. It's all here. So go on. I mean, at one point, my lips literally were like, I mean, they're paralyzed like this. I just remember thinking, I can't move my lips. Like I was starting to drool. And well, I should say this too. So the pastors explained to me, which they did a phenomenal and amazing job of walking me through all of this. And they said, you should be conscious and present this entire time. It may feel like you get taken out of the driver's seat of your like body and that you're in the passenger seat, but most of the time people are present the entire time. And so I quickly mm-hmm. experienced that, like my lips were paralyzed. And I just remember they, they said, Lauren, can, like, are you, are you there? Can you hear us? And I was like, yeah, cause they had kind of been trying to do a couple of things and nothing was really happening. And they said, we need you to call on the name of Jesus. And I was like, okay. And I was like trying to say the name of Jesus. And, and I started to slowly say it. And as I said his name, like my lips came back, like I had my lips. And wow. there were instances when they cast out anger and rage. I screamed with a scream I have never heard come out of me. Um, and just, I remembered thinking this is coming out of me right now. Um, just was shocked. I didn't have a voice for days after because of the scream that came out of my body. Um, trying to think there was just, um, I kept getting visions of different things, um, during, the deliverance session. And one of the things was I kept um, hearing the word like uterus. And I'm like, this is a weird word to like say. Um, and they ended up praying and I had not, it was like maybe TMI, but I st- this is the Lord gets the credit for this healing. But 
I hadn't had a normal a normal female cycle in three years. And since that deliverance wow. session, I have had, I'd been normal. Um, so I experienced healing, um, not only in my mind, but also physically. Um, but that just goes back to like, you can be under the influence in your mind, but also in your flesh. And I'm not saying every sickness out there is some demonic thing because Jesus healed things and people without calling out demons, but he also called out demons and people to heal them. So um, there were times where nothing was happening or my mouth kept getting stuck. That was a big thing. My mouth would get stuck. My mouth wouldn't open because when they're calling those, those demons out, it's your mouth is like the window to your body. So they're calling them up and out of your mouth. So my mouth would close and or there were times my eyes would shut and when they were telling me to look at me, um, but they would, they would call, they would say, Jesus, send your angels to attack the spirit. And as soon as they would do that, I was shrieking. Well, not me, but like the spirit inside of me would start shrieking. It was like that for hours. Um, generally, <laughs> generally, um, it doesn't necessarily take that long, but part of my story was there were things, familial things, um, that didn't come to light until after that first deliverance session that I had. So there were things I didn't know that the ties that I didn't need, to, didn't know need to be broken. And so I actually did have to go back in for a second session because there were things that had to be dealt with. I think even in that, the Lord knew that freedom needed to come in my family. And I think had it just all gotten taken care of in that first session, I don't, not that it couldn't have happened, but the Lord, he's perfect in his timing, right? And in his plans. So, but yeah, I mean, basically it was just a lot of things happening to my body that I just, I mean, not that's normal not things like that happen. You guys, just <laughs> so you know, that's not, that's not like her. The shrieking, the, the mute, not saying you talk a lot, but I'm saying <laughs> that's like those sorts of things, but they're not normal. You're also not someone to like try to put on a show like that. No. Um, I just want to add scripture to this because I did look up briefly the scripture in regards to the story of the person who was mute. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 9, um, verse 22, or let me see, it might be uh, Matthew 12, 22, excuse me. It says, then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw, Okay. So the mute component that is biblical, there's biblical precedence for that. Even the shrieking, okay, screaming in such a way that doesn't make sense. And you're like, what on earth is going on here? Acts chapter eight, verses six through eight, it says, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Finally, the last thing I want to share, we're going deep because this is what's amazing. The word of God is is secure for us. When we point things back to the word, it's like, oh, this is real. There's actually comfort in having scripture be able to point out, hey, this is what's happening here and helping us navigate through this whole thing. In regards to the hierarchy of spirits, because you talked about the deliverance process, you try to remove the chief spirit Because there could be more than one. We know the story of Jesus delivering the guy who had so many demons inside of him, so many spirits that they literally called themselves legion, which was like a Roman battalion. Like it was dozens of demons inside of this guy. And so you can have more than one at one time. And this is what sticks out to me in regards to hierarchy. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We need to understand that we are in a spiritual war and there is not a single, from a human perspective, from a, like a people perspective, there's not a single army on planet earth in human history that didn't have some sort of hierarchy of roles and functions in order to move, whether it was a righteous agenda or an unrighteous agenda for war. War doesn't happen unless there's a hierarchy in place. Everything that we see in the kingdom of God, of hierarchy, of even in hierarchy of God's angels, there's a counterfeit of that that happens in the kingdom of darkness. So just want to validate what you're saying and what you walked through. But I'd love for you practically, Lauren, to also just kind of speak from an encouraging standpoint for someone, because we're about to talk about applies not just for deliverance, but I think it also applies for healing. 
If you were to go to somebody for healing, go to the elders for healing, as it says in the book of James, if you go to the elders for healing and you don't see a hundred percent breakthrough, but let's say you saw 70% breakthrough, or let's say you saw 30 or even 10% breakthrough. I think something in us as, as humans wearing this flesh suit, we want to discredit anything that we don't see a hundred percent deliverance or healing with. And we're like, oh, it wasn't really God because it didn't really come through all the way. And I don't think that's a healthy perspective for us, quite honestly. And so you're walking through this scenario where you went into one deliverance session. Just walk us through what that looked like real quick. Was that like a five second session or was that like 10 minutes? How long was that? And then how many sessions did you end up going through? And what was your heart posture? Were you frustrated by that? Or were you encouraged that you saw the power of God moving and you were willing to walk through that process? So I know I gave you a lot to talk about, <laughs> but just like help us understand practically what that looked like from a time frame and what was going on in your heart as you were doing that. Yeah. So like I said, I mean, for me, it took me six months before I even six months went to go get to sign up to go get deliverance um, that I had wow. to work through. I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to make this easy for them. Little did I know. And then so I go in for my session. Usually max they do and everyone's different where I went specifically at my church here. You know, it was going to be two hours max. Um, after three hours, we called it quits. Um, just because I was done, uh, we really thought, we thought, okay, like we're done. Like we've got the freedom. Um, I will say after my session, I felt like I had gotten hit by a bus. I wow. felt different, but my whole body, I mean, I've, I've been in a car, like bad car accident before and my body felt that bad. Um, for the days after I had no voice, um, the people I saw were like, are you okay? Um, because I just, I was, I had been through a lot. Um, and then I think just seeing, being in that place where you were literally seeing, um, the spiritual realm, like war around you. Um, I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing if you've never seen that before. So that first session was three hours. Um, I very quickly after that first session were, was experiencing some things, but also very quickly found out after that first session, um, that there were family things I didn't know about before that first, um, session. When I opened up about going through this deliverance, um, there were things that came to light that just made it very clear of like, Oh, well, that probably should have been addressed, um, there in, Man, I will say the enemy was very, um, he was hitting hard for 10 days. Um, it was, it was actually probably one of the darkest seasons, uh, 10 days of my life. It was really hard. Um, and I kind of was like, I just went through this deliverance and like, this is how I feel. I, I was feeling freedom and like my mind was so much quieter. I could read the Bible and understood like, it, actually understand what it said. Like there was, there was a lot of freedom I was experiencing, but I also was very aware of like something isn't quite right. So I sought counsel. Um, you know, I ended up going back in for that second deliverance session. Um, we thought it was going to be real quick. Um, two hours later, I left. Now I'll say after that second one, I felt, um, so much, I felt a lot more joy. I felt so much lighter. Um, literally, I just remember I'm, <laughs> They had prayed. I was about to leave and I'm like bawling. And um, I just said, I was like, you three, because there were three people in there with me. I was like, you have seen me at my very worst in my life. Um, just because it was all things I would probably normally feel shame about just like acting the way I had been acting um, as, you know, we were going through all that and just admitting um, all these different sins. Um, shame was actually something that got cast out in the first deliverance session. And man, that's made a world of difference too. But I'll say even now, um, I think generally one or two deliverance sessions, unless someone is unwilling. Now there, there's a whole thing. Like if you are unwilling to do the work, um, to, to forgive and to let go of those sin patterns, like then you're not going to get free. Um, but if you, if you do all the work and you're still seeking, um, that deliverance, then Generally, it happens in one or two sessions. There are still a couple of things the Lord is working 
out in me um, right now. And, um, you know, I even had a conversation with the one of the pastors today and I was like, I'm still, there's some things I'm still working through. Um, and he so kindly reminded me of um, Paul and, you know, just, you know, my, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in, in your weakness. And there was that thorn in Paul's side. And, you know, he, he kept asking the Lord to take it away. And he said, people want uh, the anointing of Paul, but they don't want to go, they don't want to live the life Paul lived. Um, and, and I don't know at this point why there's still a couple things, um, that, that I'm battling, but I will tell you hands down, I have learned to look at, at fear in the face. I have learned to look at the enemy in the face and say, you need to bow in the name of Jesus. Like I, I have no wow. time for you. Um, he has come at me with night terrors. He has, um, literally literally paralyzed me in my sleep so I can't even every time I start screaming the name of Jesus and he goes right for my mouth um, and I scream it in my mind until my my mouth gets let go um so all that to say like in an encouraging way um sometimes it doesn't happen right away like the Lord has me on this journey for a reason um there's a reason I didn't get set free at the at the very first time and that's okay um I don't know that I would have grown in in just the power, like the realization of the power and victory authority that, that Jesus has given me and that the identity that I have in him, like, I don't know that I would have fully realized all that had my deliverance come that very first session. Like he's just taken me on such a journey. Um, so yeah, there's been times I've gotten a little discouraged of like, Lord, why am I still, you know, dealing with this? But he has set me free from so much um, that I am just so thankful um, I mean, it makes me on a week just thinking about like his goodness to have set me free from everything that he has. And I don't know why this came to my mind in the second, um, deliverance session. One of the things that I was dealing with is it was, it was a spirit of death. And basically when, when they were talking to the spirit, which I mean, you know, they're speaking to me, but the voice is coming. It's my voice talking. Um, but it's, it's the spirit speaking. And it, it was an assignment of the enemy on on my family generations ago, got put on our family. And, you know, they said, well, what is your assignment? And the words that came out of my mouth were to kill her. And um, I just started bawling because yeah. I just I just remembered thinking like he wants me to die. Um, but the goodness of God has carried me this far and he's so faithful to continue to carry me. And I just have to to live my everyday, like not being in fear and, um, to know, um, the power and authority that I stand in and that's in, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. One of the things that you mentioned, um, that I think is so important is the shame component, Mm. because I think, I just think I, I can think of a handful of Christians who love God like really want to follow him and want to do right, but they just can't get over certain things and they feel powerless and then they don't want to talk about it because everything they talk about it, every, like the only prescription people have is like crucify your flesh, crucify your flesh. And for some of them, it's like, I mean, y- you can't crucify a demon, right? Mm. That's what I think is is so important for people to recognize is that there's a time and a place for crucifying your flesh. There's a time and a place for saying, I don't feel like it. I don't want to do this, but I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to live through me. That is the Christian life, dying daily. However, there are certain circumstances, and we didn't talk about it too much in depth today. Maybe we will at a more appropriate time in the future, but there's things that you can take in that are either because it's our fault, because we do drugs, Mm -hmm. or because we have promiscuous sexual relationships, or because we, you know, variety of things, like things that we watch, movies that we watch, things that we listen to. But then we got to remember this too. The enemy is a thief and he does not ask for permission to violate you. Mm -hmm. Like he will take advantage of you. He will take advantage of anybody because that's in his nature. And so we need to recognize that the enemy doesn't play fair. You could have done everything right in your own power, so to speak. And the enemy could still have come in through some crack in the door or whatever. 
even through something generationally. And so my hope with this, Lauren, is that your story is showing people that they can seek help. And in fact, in the description of this episode, whether you're listening or you're watching it, we'll put a link for a deliverance map. You'll be able to find a church in your area, anywhere across the globe, where a deliverance minister has applied to be on that map. And I want to encourage you that there's a, there's a deliverance minister near you that would be willing to help you walk through this. I want to uh, finish with this, Lauren. I'd love for you to share a little bit about like uh, the visions and dreams that God has been giving you. Because even though you've been walking through a process, I need people to understand this. You are not the same person you that, you know, today that you were before you went into those deliverance sessions. It's not like you went in and something manifested and okay, well, it didn't totally like I'm not completely delivered. In fact, I like this isn't a placebo effect. God is God is completely rewiring your mind and he's like changing your disposition. He's bringing peace to your life into your to your daughter's lives into your home in a way that wasn't there before. And you're hearing his voice in a really profound and unique way. You're growing closer to him. So I'd love for you to just unpack, like, what's the Lord doing in you and through you? What's he speaking to you these days? Yeah, so that has probably been the craziest um, part. You know, I was really discouraged um, right before the deliverance session. I mean, things had just gotten so bad, so dark. Um, And our pastor at our church actually ended up like prophesying like that. Um, I was going to start getting supernatural revelation and um, I just kind of like, okay. And the deliverance happened and just the, (laughs) the visions, um, just the words the Lord has like spoken. I mean, I literally have, I don't even know. I'm like writing them all down, but I probably have 80 pages since six weeks ago of just like visions. The Lord is like constantly giving me, um, they range from things about my own children. Uh, I mentioned my, my oldest daughter, you know, she was struggling with some things. The Lord very clearly told me like she is struggling with, um, she's struggling with fear and she's struggling with depression. And I, there was one morning we were just, her and I were not having a good morning. And I just heard the Lord say, like, you need to, to pray over her. I'm like, yeah, I'll pray over her. Like, give her peace, Lord. He's like, no, no, like, we're going after these spirits. You're going to like, deliverance is happening. It happened at our kitchen table. I had all the excuses of like, I'm not a pastor. Um, This isn't how I expected it would be. My other two children are running around. But the Lord set my nine-year-old free, like she's a different child. So that has been one huge thing of just breaking those generational curses, fighting for my children. They have been experiencing a lot of this warfare also. Like my middle daughter is having all these prophetic dreams. Like she's having dreams of slaying dragons, just all Amen. this crazy stuff. Like she's like, mommy, I dreamt this and this because I no longer am walking in fear and shame and all these things. Like I am able to actually show them how to not walk in those things too. Um, because I feel like before I was like, well, you know, don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. This is what the Bible says or do not. Um, God does not give us a spirit of fear. And, you know, I could say all those verses to them all day long, but I didn't believe them in my own heart because like I, there was that, there was that like veil. There was like that, I, I couldn't get there where I fully believed it. And so um, being able to actually like model that for my children has been phenomenal. But even just, I mean, I've, there's been so many visions, but I even had one yesterday morning um, well, I've had two over the past few days about this specific video. And one of them was just, um, it was, okay, so oh, I'm like, how much do I share? So the other night, the Lord wakes me up. He says, you know, he shows me the sheet coming out of the heaven with Peter and all the animals. And he's like, read it. And I'm like, it's 1.30 a.m. I'm in a hotel room with my family. Like, can I wait till the morning? He says, no. So I pick up my phone. I'm like reading it, trying to read in the in the dark. And he's just showing me, um, you know, like Peter's praying on top of the roof and he says, um, God says, eat and um, kill and eat these animals. He's like, no, I like they're unclean and they go back and forth. And basically the Lord start, starts saying um, to me that there are people that are, are holding on to their religion and to their tradition um, and they 
they are their idols. Um, and then he goes to Cornelius's house and they had gathered all these people there together. And um, then those people end up hearing the gospel. They end up getting baptized with the Holy Spirit and they were Gentiles. And the Lord says, I want to bring, I want to bring spiritual awakening and revelation um, to people who are Christians who love me, who, who just refuse to let go of like the comfort of their religion and their tradition. And then yesterday morning I have, so I'm like, okay. And then yesterday morning I have this vision and it is literally people watching this video and, um, scales are falling from their eyes. The veil is being lifted. They are realizing mm -hmm. that chains are around their wrists. And um, they're realizing the bondage that they're in. And the words coming out of my mouth were like fire. They're not my words. They're words from the Holy Spirit. And they were starting mm. to just break all of that bondage. Jeez. And so um, I just, and literally the verse, I think it's Jeremiah 20. The Lord says like, there's a verse to look up about fire. And I'm like, okay, well, what is it? And um, it's literally, I should find it. It's Jeremiah 23, 29, I think. And um it says, sorry, I should have like had it pulled up, but I didn't know I was going to be sharing this. <laughs> oh, I got it right here. Can I read it? Yeah. I think it's twenty three twenty nine, okay. where it talks about the word being like fire. Yes. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. So I, I found that and I'm like, man, the Lord really just want to set people free. But I really heard him saying that there are just there's so many people that are holding on to the comfort to mm. tradition and to religion that they feel shame mm. and they just don't want they're holding on to those things so tightly but he showed me and a lot of these are moms um specifically like me um and and they feel shame and and that they feel so tired and um that that they feel this battle in their mind all the time and he wants to set them free and he said that the that what is ahead of them is too great um, the mission before them, what he has in store for them is too great for them to miss out on it. Um, so it's time for them to let go of those things. And I just was like, whoa, okay. All right, God, let's do this. So, <laughs> so awesome. Lauren, I'm, first of all, I'm just so proud of you and I'm so grateful for your courage to share your story. I really believe that this is going to do exactly what the Lord revealed to you. That's going to going to give people the freedom. I've heard this said, and I use it a lot. When someone, uh, let's say someone goes to the altar, I do an altar call after church. I say, if you want to give your life to Jesus, come to the altar. There's something that happens when the first person goes up, and it mm. gives everybody else the permission to go next. Yes. And I think your ability to just be vulnerable and share your story. You gave somebody else the gift of not having to go first, mm. but to just go next. My hope is for somebody listening to this right now or watching this, if you've been in that place, if you've been experiencing that shame, if you've been dealing with thoughts, voices in your head that have kept you from really living God's best for your life, if you've been stuck in patterns of anger or lust or addiction, let me tell you, Jesus came to set the captives free. He fully intends to liberate you and for you to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lauren, I just want to pray for those individuals right now. I'd love for you just to agree with me in prayer. Yes. And if you're in that place right now, as you're listening or watching and you're like, you know what? I know that I know that this is for me. I want you, if you're driving, keep your eyes open. But if you're not driving, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to be fully present in this moment. Mm -hmm. I'd even invite you to put a, your hand over your heart as you pray this and just agree with me in prayer as we go before the Father for you. So Father, in the name of Jesus, for the person behind the screen right now that is just absolutely bound, bound by lust, bound by addiction, bound by anger, bound by cynicism, bound by self-judgment, bound by self-harm, bound by eating disorders, bound by just mental, just infirmity, God, I pray in the name of Jesus for you to overwhelm them right now with your love, your perfect love, cast out all fear. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would have an encounter with you right now. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would lead them to repentance. They would surrender it all to you, knowing that we are all sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of our sin is death, not just in this life, but in the life to come. But Jesus you came to pay the price for us in full. You laid down your life 
You lived the perfect life that we could never live and you died a death that we deserve on that cross. You were brutally murdered. You were put in a tomb. And on the third day, you rose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit so that anyone who would simply turn from their sin and put their trust in you, not in their efforts, not in sorcerers, not in mystics, not in psychics, not in psychologists or therapists or in their good works, but in you, Jesus, in you alone, in what you've accomplished alone. When we put our trust in you, we thank you, God, that there is first salvation, but you also did not just solely bring salvation for our spirit, but you intended to heal our body and deliver our soul from the evil one. And in the name of Jesus, right now, we come against the accuser of the brethren. We come against that enemy that roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And we muzzle him and bind him in the name of Jesus. We command him to come out, to flee, to leave the person behind that screen. Every foul spirit, every unclean spirit, every demonic entity dwelling in the body, in the soul of the person behind this screen, we put you on notice. We call the fire of God upon you now in the name of Jesus. We command you to come up and out of their body, out of their mouth, and go into the pit where Jesus says to go. Father, we thank you for complete liberation. Every chain broken now in the name of Jesus. Everything bound in heaven as it's, or bound on earth as it's bound in heaven, we loose the power of God over them in the name of Jesus. Father, would you fill their heart, fill their mind? Would you remove every anxious thought from them in the name of Jesus? Tear down every stronghold in their minds and in their hearts that's keeping them from receiving the revelation that they are no longer an orphan, they are adopted, that they are not second class, they are the head, they are not the tail, they are the first, they are not the last, they are chosen by you, you love them, they are more than conquerors through you who love them, and we thank you, God, that the victory is theirs. We yes. declare it over them today. Mm, yes. God, overwhelm them with the revelation of your victory. Yes, Jesus, yes. you paid for it in mm. full. Collect your spoils. Collect your spoils in their life today. And may your perfect peace that surpasses understanding rule in their hearts right now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Whoa. Hey, Amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> hey, yeah. again, if you're it's powerful, <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you what, I've, I've seen it before, Lauren. This is what's super cool. We've done videos where we'll just literally like pray for healing for people mm. through a 60 second video. We'll deploy it on the internet and then people will send direct messages and say, I, my shoulder's better. My neck's better. Like my foot's feeling better. So we know Yay. that the, the power of God is not bound by a geographic location. He's not bound by a screen. And so we want you to fully receive that. But if you need pray for healing for people mm. through a 60 second video, we'll deploy it on the internet. And then people will send direct messages and say, my shoulder's better. My neck's better. Like my foot's feeling better. So we know yeah, that yeah. the power of God is not bound by a geographic location. He's not bound by a screen. And so we want you to fully receive that. But if you need uh, if you need more help, let me tell you, there's a couple links in the description that I want to point you to. Number one is a deliverance map. Make sure you click that map. There's a map curated of a handful of deliverance ministers that have volunteered to be on this map all over the world. There's going to be someone near you who can help you, who can spend some time with you and help you receive the freedom that Jesus paid a high price for you to receive. There's another link that I also invite you to click. This link is basically your next step with God. Whether you are giving your life to Jesus today for the first time and you want some help, you want some free resources, you want someone to reach out and pray for you, this link is for you. If you're looking for an online church community, I want to invite you to be a part of the Love Church online church community. That's the church that I'm the online pastor of. Same link, click that link. If you have a prayer request, click that link. That link is to help you take your next step with God. We want to help and facilitate that next step for you. Otherwise, guys, thanks so much for joining us on Directed Life today. Lauren, you were a phenomenal guest. Mm -hmm. Again, I honor you. I'm so grateful for you and for Brendan. And uh, man, thank you so much for being willing to share your story today. Thank you for having me.